Hello, and welcome to another episode of Two Guys and a Chainsaw. I'm Todd. I'm Craig. And today's film was We Are Still Here. Craig, uh, you chose this film. Uh, what was? What were you thinking? <laughs> Well, I'll be honest with you, um, it's kind of been uh, a long week for me, a busy week, and uh, I was looking through our list that uh, we've kind of put together, and um, I've heard some stuff about this movie just a little bit, uh, but really the selling point for me was that it was short. <laughs> uh, it was only about an hour and 25 minutes long, and so uh, I thought we'd, we'd, we'd give it a go. <laughs> That's great. What did you heard about it? Not a whole lot. You know, I, I remember seeing um, some articles, I think, on Bloody Disgusting or, or something like that um, around the time when it came out or when it was coming out. Uh, and it, the articles didn't have a whole lot to say. And now having seen the movie, I'm kind of glad because I feel like if they had talked about it too much or given too much away, um, that wouldn't have been a good thing. But uh, I, I saw generally positive uh, reviews, and so I was intrigued and intrigued by the fact that I really didn't know much about it at all. Um, so I, I figured we'd give it a go. You know, it's nice every once in a while to just pop into a movie when you haven't seen a preview, you haven't really read about it, um, just the way we used to watch movies. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> With minimal information, um, and, and in this case, not even any anticipation. Um, right. I'd never heard of it before, but it did come out last year, and I guess it was a big hit at the 2015 South by Southwest Film Festival. Um, critically received well, apparently it's commercially done well too, and the a writer-director, whose name I will probably mispronounce, but it's... a uh, what is it, uh, Ted Gyogigan? Gyogigan? <laughs> I'll take word for it. <laughs> Something like that. About our age, really. Um, this is uh, his writing, directing thing that's propelling him up there. I guess he's written a bunch of other stuff. Uh, since 2001, he's been writing uh, almost a movie a year. Uh, but this is maybe one of his few um, director credits. I think he's only done... International Playboy's first movie, Ghouls Gone Wild, wow. <laughs> back in 2004. But he's working on a big movie now called Mohawk um, that's going to be coming out in another year um, based on, I guess, the the uh, momentum uh, af behind this film. Uh, cool. You know, I uh, jumped into it, obviously not knowing anything about it. It is about uh, starts out with a couple... Um, Annie and Paul, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And they're driving through the wintry uh, day. They're obviously kind of quiet and depressed. They're about middle-aged. At least they seem to be about middle-aged. Right. And uh, they're not talking much, but you get the sense that they're moving. And they're, we find out later that they've moved from the big city uh, to this small house out in the middle of nowhere near this tiny town uh, to get away from the tragedy of their son's death. Right. Um, and I guess their son was probably in about in his 20s, it looks like, or maybe late teens uh, when he died and uh, died in a car accident. And so that's where they're going. And, you know, at first I got the impression that they were returning to like a previous home. I don't know if you got that sense. At least I found the movie a little hard to follow at times. And that was the first thing that um, I couldn't quite figure out until about, oh, about 20 minutes in when I realized, no, they'd never lived in this house before. Right, yeah, I, I was a little confused too, and I think part of that comes from the some of the dialogue uh, is is pretty quiet, and I had to uh, pause and, and rewind to hear what people had said a couple of times, and there were a couple of times um, when I did that, and I still was uncertain. Um, in the beginning, like you said, it's really it's quiet, you know, there's not a lot of talking going on between the two, it's more just kind of uh, atmospheric, and you get the sense that um, there's there's sadness, you know, going on, and um, I think uh, Paul at some point says, uh, he says something about having had somebody set up the house for them, um, mm -hmm. so everything's going to be ready for them when they get there, and, and Annie uh, asks, you know, well, how will they know where to put the pictures, and he says, well, I told them, um, so, uh, and <laughs> having read, you know, the one sentence blurb on uh, IMDb, I knew that they were moving to this new house, so um, I wasn't quite yet lost there, but you mentioned um, that they're, they're moving after this tragedy of having lost their son, and you get that impression very early on, because as soon as they get there, 
Um, they're kind of setting up the house. You get a little brief montage of them. You know, it's it's mostly set up for them, but um, uh, Annie's going around kind of uh, putting up some pictures and things, and she puts up a picture of a young man um, who I presumed was their son. Um, and then uh, after that, she starts going through a box um, of what presumably are, are his things. You know, it's like old uh, trophies and um, baseball stuff and uh, so, yeah, th- that was the sense I got. We really don't find out until, I would say, at least halfway through the movie. Well, maybe not that far, but a good ways into the movie, um, it, it takes until we find out what actually happened to him. Um, but it is established pretty early on that uh, he has died. And so, uh, yeah, so they, so they get into the, to the house. And uh, and there's, I would say, one of the really good points of this movie is it did a really good job of setting up a feeling of dread and also a bit of tension. I think, you know, you're going to a horror film and uh, the instant she puts the son's <clears throat> picture up kind of on a table, uh, there's this moment where they're watching television and the camera slowly pans over and that that uh, picture falls forward on of its own accord. Right. And so you immediately are set up for, okay, this is going to be kind of a haunted house story or it's, it's something about some, the, dead, uh, n- the dead spirit of the sun. And right away, uh, she feels like there's a presence in the house. And uh, there are weird noises when she's setting up, a lot of times when she's alone. And so she kind of goes exploring. She goes down into the basement, which for this house is the biggest basement <laughs> 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 with so many rooms. <laughs> right. But, uh, yeah, and, and, of course, that's really creepy. And I have to say, I was on the edge of my seat for most of that, uh, kind of wondering what was going to happen. But then I guess what set up my confusion and made me wonder if they hadn't returned to this house is she's poking around and you get the sense that she, that maybe it's the spirit of Bobby who is haunting them. And when she goes in the basement and shines her flashlight around, maybe there's an apparition, maybe there's not, but there's definitely movement down there. And she shines it down on the ground at some point and there is a baseball glove with the name Bobby written across it. Right. Now... Were we supposed to assume that was a coincidence? Were we supposed to assume that was something maybe she just thought she saw or that they had had some things unpacked and some people had tossed that in the basement? I think the way that I read it was that, um, you know, one of the things that I liked about the movie was that it jumped right in. You know, it really was kind of a slow burn for the first half, but um, the, the the creepy, strange stuff starts happening right away. Like you said, the picture frame falls over right away. That's probably in the first five minutes. Uh, and then when she's unpacking that box, she hears something down in the basement, and that's what leads her down there. And, and like you said, you know, it's, it's dark, it's shadowy, you can't really see what's going on, but she finds finds that uh, baseball glove. My, un- the way that I read it was that whatever was going on in the house, whatever was tipping over pictures and, and whatnot, somehow got that glove down there. Because what she was looking through was a box, you know, right when this happened, when she started hearing things in the basement, what she oh. was doing was she was looking through that box of baseball stuff. Yeah. Um, and then uh, when she's down there, after she finds the glove, then the baseball, which she had just had in her hands in the box upstairs, comes rolling down um, the stairs. Uh, so obviously something in the house is moving things around, and that's the impression I got. And from that, the impression that she gets is that the spirit of their son is with them, um, has followed them to the house. And that's that's really the premise that uh, she is working under um, for all of the movie, really. She, you know, so, she believes Bobby's there. So you think that kind of explains why she doesn't get suitably freaked out at all this stuff? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I, and I think you know that's I, these actors um, in, in the movie. Uh, Anne is played by played by Barbara uh, Crampton, who I kind of recognize, but you know it was just kind of a, a vague familiarity. And, and when I after the movie was over, and I, I kind of looked up some information about it, I saw that you know she was in uh, Reanimator. Um, she played the mom in Your Next, uh, and then the the dad uh, Paul. Um, I'll probably mispronounce his name, but it's uh, Andrew Sinsenig. Uh, and he looked familiar. I couldn't recognize him for anything. Um, I, I, I looked at his IMDb credits, and he's got 99 acting credits. So obviously this is a guy that's been working a lot, but nothing jumped out to me um, as being familiar as something that I'd seen him in. Uh, now- but, but they both 
and and other actors that come in later they're very low key it's it's very downplayed um I, I don't think that it's poor acting at all. I, quite the opposite. I think that it's good acting, but it's very subtle and it feels very real. Um, so sometimes it's difficult to read them, and then at other times I feel like you don't want to try to read too much into it. You just kind of want to, you know, this is a woman who's lost her son, and she's having these strange occurrences that lead her to believe that her son's spirit is there. And she's embracing that, you know, she's not scared. Um, She's a little unsettled, um, but I think at the same time, she's kind of hoping that it's him. You know, she doesn't want to let go. Um, And so less than being scared, it's almost more like she's excited or, or finding comfort in the fact that he may still be with them in some way. Yeah, I think in retrospect, I can get behind that. Um, it kind of confused me at the beginning because I felt like, and maybe this is just me, but I feel like about any supernatural circumstance is going to be something that's going to freak you out more than it's going to give you comfort. But I suppose if you think it's your dead son, uh, right. then maybe you do feel pretty good about it, or at least it's going to help you while you're in that grieving moment that they're clearly in. And, th- and that is definitely... Um, Obvious. <laughs> yeah. She worse than her husband. Now, I thought her acting. Oh, by the way, uh, I don't know if you recognized her from Chopping Mall either, but she was Susie in Chopping Mall. Oh, really? No, I didn't. <laughs> That's funny. Chopping Mall keeps coming back to haunt us. I think. <laughs> That's all right. So it's like the Kevin Bacon of uh, of movies. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's. I don't know. You know, I have to say, I thought her acting was the best. I felt like a lot of the other acting was pretty uneven. Maybe I blame the writing, too. Um, I I know this film has been critically received, but I have to be honest. I felt like the it was like a, a paint-by-numbers script. I just thought there were too many cliches uh, as it went through. I mean, you get the, the haunted house set up, and then you get them talking about their dead son, uh, and then immediately... Uh, I think the next thing that happens is uh, they get a visit. Yeah. They get a visit from two uh, two people, Dave and Kat, an older man and his wife. And, of course, it's, oh, we're the neighbors. And, oh, you haven't been over. You know, you're the first neighbor people who have been over to visit us in two weeks since we've come to the town. And he's all like, oh, well, that's kind of strange. You, you know, you'd think the town would be hopping because you're moving into this place. And then... They come into the house and are very unsettled by it, and they immediately dive into the story of the house. So the, uh, the, the realtor told you all about the Dagmars, huh? Yes, that was the family, thank you, who first lived here, right? Yes, yes, that's right. I mean, the town built this house for them back in 1859. Hmm. Wasn't long after that that the, uh, the trouble began. Old Dagmar had been running the bottom no more than a couple months when, uh, well, wouldn't you know, word got out that uh, they were selling the bodies and burying empty coffins. People were saying he was uh, selling the corpses to the university over in uh, Essex County. Some even said he was selling to the Orientals over in Boston, turning them into chop suey. <laughs> and then he says, well... Ah, uh, you know, I guess I, I shouldn't dive into devils right away. We'll be seeing you. <laughs> right. And I walks out. You're saying. You know, there's, you know, there's definitely some really super formulaic writing, um, you know, with the neighbors showing up. And, uh, you know, the, the husband is kind of seemingly normal, uh, Dave. But then when juxtaposed against his wife, who there's clearly something off with, uh, like she seems really unsettled. She seems very nervous. Like she doesn't talk very much. And when she does talk, she kind of only talks to her husband in kind of hushed tones. And it seems like he's kind of trying to get her to shut up. Um, you know, something weird is going on. And yeah, they tell that, oh, it's the old Dagmar place. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's the creepy haunted house backstory that you've got to get. Um, and then he's got lines like, uh, well, I, I'm glad you're here because this house needs a family. It's been 30 years since we had fresh souls in the Dagmar house. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, I can see how that could come across as cliched. Um, I think for me, it was more almost like a, just a throwback to an old school 
haunted house kind of story, and I thought it was a little bit charming. Um, you know, I, I don't know anything about the production of this movie or, or you know, what kind of budget they had. It feels um, like an independent film. Uh, you know, it's a yeah. small cast. Um, there's not a lot of expensive special effects stuff going on. However, you know, there are some cool special effects things later in the movie, but um, it just felt kind of low-key. It almost, you know... It, it 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 could serve very well, I think, um, in some regards as a play because the the cast is so limited and um, yeah. the locations are very limited and um, so yeah you know I, I I'm kind of with you but at the same time um, I don't know it, it, it to me it kind of struck a balance between being a classic horror story haunted house story but also kind of fresh. Like, it went in some directions that were unexpected. You know, in hindsight, in looking back on it, having watched the whole thing, um, the twists and things aren't really all that original, but I didn't see them all coming, so um, I'll give it that anyway. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. In fact, it almost feels written like a play because the dialogue is almost too economical you know again uh, the, the guys come over and he comes over and immediately launches into the haunted house story and then says well we better go um there the dialogue between the husband and wife when he's consoling her you know when paul is consoling annie feels like something i've seen before you know it's yeah. it's i could almost predict the the words that would come out of their mouths next and that kind of disappointed me but you're right um what what does kind of happen is a little it does keep you wondering because uh, for example they keep ta- he keeps talking about how the basement is getting super super hot and he needs mm-hmm. to call the electrician out to to check it out um which is a little weird why you'd call the electrician out maybe it was an electric furnace except it seemed like it was a a, a, a wood furnace or a I gas no furnace. Right. At the same time, they had a wood burning stove upstairs. Th- these little things kind of distract me, but <laughs> you know, whatever. They call the the guy over, and he, of course, has to go down into the basement, the electrician, to a uh, play to fix things. And as he's poking and prodding around, the lights go out and they go back on, and they go out and they go back on. Um, and there's that whole sequence where he gets attacked uh, mm-hmm. by this menacing spirit, which I thought was rather frightening. Yeah, yeah, it's like this smoldering figure um, looks like it's uh, burned and and still just just kind of, you know, ashen and and smoldering. You know, it's kind of a jump scare. It jumps out at him and and, and grabs his arm, I think, and um, I think he kind of, you know, he screams from downstairs and and, um, the husband, uh, Dave, runs down and and thinks that he's been burned like in an electrical short or something. Um, the the electrician doesn't say anything, you know, doesn't tell them that he's seen a ghost down there or whatever. Um, but now we know, and that's the thing, you know, that's kind of the thing that that I one of the things that I liked about the movie was that it left me wondering um, throughout. I didn't know how far they were going to go. Uh, mm, I yeah. really expected it you know, in the beginning to just be kind of a bump in the night thing, strange things happening. I didn't know if we were actually going to get some sort of, you know, monster or apparition or ghost or whatever. And then when it appeared, um, and it, this first time, and it it was really pretty frightening, um, uh, atmospherically and visually. Um, then I'm just wondering, okay, you know, how, obviously this is some sort of malevolent force who, has the potential to cause harm, um, how much farther than that is it going to go? And I I just kept kind of being surprised. Um, You know, like you said, it's a little clunky. It's set up from the beginning. You know, after when when Dave and Kat, as they're leaving, um, Kat hands... uh, Oh, excuse me, when... Yeah, yeah, the neighbors. When Kat hands um, Paul a note that says... The house needs, underlined, a family. Get out! Exclamation point. Um, so we know there's something weird going on. We know, obviously, that uh, at least these neighbors, if not the rest of the townspeople, know that there's something weird going on. And then, with the electrician, we see the ghost or whatever it is, and um, and then it just kind of picks up from there. It moves right into, and, and again, I just felt like this was so cliche, but whatever. Uh, it moves right into 
uh, a conversation between Annie and Pal, and, and Annie is basically and and I thought actually this was some of the worst dialogue in the film, and I have to say I thought the acting laid it bare. I still feel something here. So what are we going to do about it? What if Jacob and May came up for the weekend? May has always been interested in this stuff. She told me once that people pay her to do seances. People with too much money. And you like Jacob. He's always so... Stoned. Earthy. And they wrote us that lovely note after the accident. They said they'd always be there for us. I just think they might be able to help. You already invited them, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, maybe she Our can friend May, us. who does the seances. Let's have right. her over. <laughs> who, who, by the way, as I read it, happens to be the the parents of this their dead son's roommate at college. Right. Right. Yeah. So, like, oh, come on. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> right. And, <laughs> well, and, and then she- as soon as you know, as soon as they say that, basically, I mean, they have that conversation. I believe while the workman's down in the basement. So then the thing happens with the workman, um, and then right away we jump to Jacob and May in the car, and they are, you know, these stereotypical characters where she's kind of, you know, your classic. Uh, airy you know kind of spiritualist and um he's the wild-haired stoner and um yeah kind of cliche characters i don't know i just feel like it bothered you for some reason more than it did me (laughs) i i I just i you know when these things happened and these characters were introduced yeah they were exactly what i expected but it it seemed in step with the tone of the movie. Like, I, it mm. just, it felt like, okay, yeah, all right, now they're going to have their friends over and, and we're going to pre- keep pushing the plot along, maybe find out a little bit more about what's going on in this house. Right, and their friends happen to be uh, able to contact spirits, or at least that's a hobby of theirs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so they end up coming over and they say, oh, by the way, our son, uh, Harry, and his girlfriend are going to be joining us here as well, but they came up separately. So they go to the burger joint in town. Uh-huh. And again, they walk into this burger joint, which is more like a bar, and all the townspeople are in there and they're absolutely quiet. You know, oh, it's that classic thing. In. You know, I swear to God, if I'm ever anywhere <laughs> and I walk into a restaurant or a bar and every single local stops talking and just stares at me silently, I'm going to know it's time to get out of there. You know, something <laughs> something bad is going down. And they, you know, it, they even comment on it. You know, when, when they're sitting there eating their dinner, they're talking about, uh, I guess these people don't take very kindly to strangers. Nice place you picked here. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going to finish my meal watch my back you know like they obviously know something weird is going on and yeah i mean that is cliche we've seen that in a dozen movies that we've talked about so um i can see where you're coming from well and then they're having their conversation in there and they say something about the house and suddenly a waitress breaks a glass right (laughs) and everybody falls silent for a moment i mean like really (laughs) really I'm sorry. It, it was very distracting for me, and and I mean, it's clearly an independent production. And although some of the upper level, upper list actors were were good, um, when you look at some of the acting of the extras or the bit players in here, there's a stark contrast, I think, in their ability to sort of pull it off convincingly. I, I didn't really think that the bartender uh, was very convincing. Uh, I don't know, and. See, and I then, wonder. I wonder if the problem that you have with it is that they were taking themselves so seriously. Like it's not played tongue in cheek at all. Um, you know, when well, we've seen this, you know, like this this walk into the local place and have the locals all look at you. We've seen that in Witching and Bitching. We've seen it in that goofball horror movie that you had us watch. Uh, what, what was it? The one where they eventually end up singing in the bar. Yes, yes, um, Bloodbath at the House of Death. Right, but so we've seen this over and over again, and usually it's kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and here they're playing it straight, and so maybe well, that doesn't read quite as well. 
Well, I think it's wink, wink, nudge, nudge for a reason, you know, because like nobody in their right mind would think of putting this kind of stuff into a movie nowadays because it's so cliche unless they were making fun of it. And you're right. They're not making fun of it here. And maybe it's stretching into homage territory. You I know, think like so. The, but, but again, as we said last week, I feel like it begs the question, when is an homage, a loving homage, and when does an homage really – also in a way need to stand on its own and be original you know do we really want to see a movie with all the cliches thrown into it call it homage and love it for that or is that kind of movie really not what we want to see anyway i i mean you know well I, yeah i do know what you mean and and you know you had us watch and i'm glad you did i enjoyed it um zombie 2 and that's a, a lucio fulci uh film correct Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this, um, what I read is that this movie is uh, inspired by his films, uh, specifically uh, The House by the Cemetery, which I haven't seen, so I have no point of reference. Um, But, you know, I I wonder if that's what they were going for, um, was really, you know, kind of an homage to those types of films, and perhaps rather than poke fun at them, they really kind of wanted to give it a go and, and, you know make one of these types of films. You know, it's it's set in the late 70s, um, so it's got already kind of an older school vibe to it. Um, in, in that regard, it reminded me a little bit of, like, The House of the Devil. Uh, yes, uh, very and, much and so. And other movies that seem to be kind of throwbacks to those late 70s uh, horror films. And I didn't think it was entirely unsuccessful. I... <laughs> when all said and done, you know, I thought it was a, a pretty decent movie, but I can see where your criticisms come from. You know, and and I love those full. You know, I love those full yeah. movies. Um, but you know, they came at a particular time in a particular place, and they have a style about them. Whether you like the style or not, it, you're able to overlook <laughs> a multitude of sins in the storyline and in a plot that usually makes no sense and in dialogue that's silly because there's a style there. And if this director was trying to cop that same style, I won't say he was unsuccessful, but I would say that he got about halfway there. But there's just something kind of missing uh, about it. Uh, that I can't quite put my finger on, but I'm going to try to by the end of this podcast. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, from there, it's not that the plot is thin. It's just, you know, some big things just kind of start happening in sequence. Like uh, the the parents, you know, the group of four adults, they all, as, as soon as they get there, basically, um, they all leave and, like you say, go to that bar for dinner. And they leave a note on the door um, for Harry, the son, and his girlfriend. And Harry and the girlfriend show up, and uh, they go inside, and they make themselves comfortable, and um, they kind of start to act like they're maybe going to start to fool around or make out or something, but then they hear uh, something strange, uh, some weird noise. So Harry goes off to investigate, and he thinks the noise came from the basement, so he walks down there, and he's down at the bottom of the steps, and uh, his girlfriend, who I don't even know if she had a name, but... um, She's standing at the top of the stairs, and he's at the bottom, um, and we're just kind of switching back and forth between their perspectives. So we'll see his face in close-up, and then we'll see her face in close-up, and he says something like, boy, it sure is hot down here, and she's looking down, and there's kind of, we see this look of fear come over her face, and it cuts back to him, and clearly he notices it too. You Okay. I thought it was hilarious that the girlfriend's response was just to hightail it out of there. Um, she, you know, she she runs out the door, jumps in the car, and starts taking off. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, that there's some loyalty for you. Um, and I'm thinking, I, okay, so I guess she's just going to take off, so nobody's going to know what happens. Um, but as she's driving along, this burning hand bursts through the back of the seat, bursts all the way through her body. Um, and she's dead too, and the car just kind of careens off uh, into a field. And that that really took me off guard. Um, I didn't expect there to be that kind of carnage in this movie. Um, I didn't expect the threat to be that intense. I didn't expect, you know, this character who was the son of the, or excuse me, the roommate um, of the kid who had already died. I didn't expect these deaths uh, to happen. And, and so um, it, it kind of kept me guessing as to where it was going to go and how far it was going to go. 
No, I'm I'm totally with you. I, it was very bold. You know, with, with these haunted house movies, it, sometimes it's like, like, like again, with the electrician. Oh, well, he could have just electrocuted himself. Right. Oh, something fell off, you know, the balcony. It hit somebody on the head. Was it a ghost or was it an accident? But in these cases, there is the apparition, like, with his hands on the guy's head, almost looking like he's splitting it open and, of course, right. putting his hand through her chest. Um, that does set the tone for a whole different kind of movie. And, uh, and it, Again, it is very in keeping with Fulci's uh, type of film, and I haven't. I saw the House by the Cemetery a long time ago. Um, I do remember that the ghost was in the um, apparitions looked a lot like this, and uh, they were definitely in the basement. Um, so I couldn't tell you how closely it's right. paralleling that, but in its boldness, uh, it definitely parallels his whole oeuvre, where it's you know the threat is always very real. Um, it's very prescient. It's very. Um, it's not a wistful little apparition that comes and goes necessarily. It's a very real three-dimensional object that's there and it's going to get you. Right. And it's not like something like, um, uh, was it the woman in black with Daniel Radcliffe that we watched? Mm -hmm. Uh, where, you know, there's a ghost and the ghost is scary, but you don't really feel like there's really all that much of a threat, (laughs) you know, like, yeah, uh, not really, you know, it doesn't really seem like anybody's in real danger. You know, here it it really felt like people, you know, are in, in real danger. And, uh, you know, and, and it moves quickly, you know, when, when, uh, Harry gets killed, May, his mother, um, is at uh, the restaurant still, and she reacts like she has some kind of, you know, guttural reaction. Like she doesn't know what's happened, but she has this bad feeling. Um, And so I don't think that that's what necessarily leads them to go back. You know, I think they're just done, but they go back. And then we get this scene with these two waitresses at Buffalo Bill's, this bar slash burger joint. Um... And there's a knock on the door, and they're like, we're closed, Um, but the knock is persistent, so the older one, Maddie, sends the younger one to the door, and uh, she goes to the door, and then all we hear is a gunshot, and then Dave and Kat, the older couple, the neighbors from before, walk in, and the older waitress was like, oh, if I had known it was you, I wouldn't have sent the new girl. And, And again, this was just something that kind of threw me. Like, did Dave and Kat shoot that other waitress? And if so, I mean, why? <laughs> you know, like exactly. Well, still, <laughs> even after seeing the movie, that still makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, I don't get it at all. It um, makes no sense. And but you're right; it does throw you off guard, and it's jolting. But it's just jolting to be jolting because there's no rhyme or reason to it. Right. Uh, except you know, now we know that Dave is a dangerous character, and they're dealing. Um, he's somehow he and obviously at least her and possibly more of the town people are involved and know exactly what's going on at the house and are even perpetuating it in some way, shape, or form. Well, and and Dave is like the scary exposition giver. (laughs) (laughs) Like, here we get, you know, this backstory. You know, he's talking to Maddie and he's saying... You do realize what will happen if they leave, don't you? Yeah. Do you really, Maddie? Do you? The town didn't realize it back in 49. And when that darkness didn't get a new family, it spread like a plague until it found many. And he says there's a darkness in the house that wakes up every 30 years um, and it's hungry. Um, And he says, you know, if the Dagmars haven't killed them yet, we'll have to do it ourselves. Or she says we'll have to do it ourselves or something like that. Um, So there's obviously something going on. The townspeople obviously know about it. And again, this was another twist that I didn't really see coming. You know, I thought, okay, the townspeople know. Maybe the townspeople want them to stay there for some reason because they have to be some kind of sacrifice or something. But when the house isn't killing these people these townspeople are just ready to take matters into their own hands and do it themselves if they have to. And I, yeah. I, I just didn't, I, I'm like, I, I knew that there had to be more to the story and I didn't know what it was. Um, and it was confusing, but I was kind of happy when later on it's sort of kind of explained uh, a little it, bit. It kind of is, but it still doesn't make a lot of sense. Does it? I, I mean, well, there are just a lot of holes in that, and and boy, he's he's 
he's writing it real close to Fulci, <laughs> right. whose whose stories also never make any sense. And honestly, again, we're talking cliches, and this guy telling somebody what they already know just so he can be exposition man for us who are watching. Um, I just would expect more <laughs> than that, you know, something a little more subtle, something a little better. Uh, especially since we get it all again at the end when we finally do figure out what's going on. Right. From the same man. Right. You know? Right. Uh, it's, I don't know, I, I just think it was just really distracting for me. But anyway, the the family goes back to the house and they don't know that the uh, son and his girlfriend are dead because they don't go in the basement and they obviously didn't pass her car on the street and the they never took that note off the door right. so they figure, well, they... they they left so uh they get there and they sit around and they chat some more and are we going to have a seance and uh the woman i think is kind of against it uh, because she says no you don't need a seance i can feel a presence in this house already it's already here and it's bad Um, you know she says um it's it's dark you know there's darkness all around and and um again the the main woman annie you know keeps saying it's bobby i know it's bobby i i can feel him i can hear him you know sometimes she uh and and her husband kind of hear this really muted whispering in the background um and they think it's him um they're seeing more things like um Paul uh, in the night, you know, sees the, some of those apparitions, the burning apparitions, but he kind of wakes up and thinks maybe it was a dream. But there's all kinds of things going on. Um, but in the morning, oh well, and um, the the May, the one who you know has these spiritual tendencies or whatever, she says. It's not Bobby. It's something that wants you to think that it's Bobby, but it's not him. Um, mm-hmm. And so she doesn't want to really get into it. Uh, so she and um, Annie go into town for groceries just to kind of get away from the house. And while they're gone, Jacob says, we're going to do a seance right now. Um, and and Paul says, well, would May like that? And he says, no, <laughs> she wouldn't. That's why we're going to do it right now when they're gone. And um, so they start this seance. And I actually thought that this scene was really kind of spooky and uh, oh, effectively yes. creepy. The seance was fantastic. Uh, the leading up to it, I thought, was a little clunky. My favorite mm-hmm. line, maybe my favorite bad line in the whole movie, was when Paul turns to Jacob and says, Well, if you can disprove my skepticism, I will be very, very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, who talks like that? <laughs> <laughs> true, very true. <laughs> but yeah, no, you're right. This scene was fantastic. Yeah, I fantastic. mean, they start this seance and, and you know... Um, the Jacob is is leading it or whatever. They've lit candles or whatever, and um, he starts talking. He's reading out of a book. It's all very standard stuff that you see in any kind of seance in a movie. Um, but then he starts saying disturbing things. This house welcomes his spirit and asks him to join us. And with love and compassion we will help him cross to the next realm and peel the skin off his bones what did you say and he's like oh no it's just standard seance stuff um, and he, he keeps on um, talking, and again, it kind of goes back to standard stuff. But then he says something else like, um, uh, I'm asking, well, first he says, I'm asking my son to join us. And Paul says, don't you mean my son? And he's like, oh, yeah, uh, your son. Uh, and I want him to come here so he can rot like wasted meat. And it's really, it's it's subtle enough that you're a little bit uncertain what's going on. But at the same time, by the time he starts saying the creepy stuff, repeatedly you realize that something is taking him over that it's not him it's somebody else speaking through him and and the actor i thought did a good job of playing that subtlety so that it wasn't an immediate shift it had you guessing a little bit but at the same time it was really unsettling um and then eventually of course whatever entity has taken him over takes over fully um and then he's straight up possessed 
Oh, it's fantastic. Um, and it's really brilliant. I mean, one of the one of the brilliant moments in this film actually was exactly what you described and how he played it. You know, when you hear it that first time, you're also doing kind of a double take. Like, did I just hear what I just heard? And then, of course, after that, it just forces you to listen intently to what right. he's saying. Like, every little word, um, it just really razor focuses your mind. It keeps you on the edge of your seat until he does burst out, and it just makes it ten times more freaky. Yeah, and then things from this point, I feel like, move really fast. Like, up until this point, it had been a little bit of a slow burn. You know, things have been happening. It, I, I was never bored, um, but it, it was kind of building slowly. And then, from this point on, it's just boom, 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 boom. Um, the the girls' women come back, um, and uh, Paul has Jacob tied to a chair, and, and Jacob is, you know, clearly possessed, freaking out. Um, uh, Paul has gagged him with it looks like a sweat sock or something um, and Jacob just like ingests it and swallows it like you see it going down his throat and it's super creepy and then uh, he starts talking Um, his wife May asks him what happened and he says this town is what happened this is my house Um, so we assume that this is Dagmar the guy that we heard about before Um, and uh, at the same time Kat the old neighbor lady who was acting weird from the beginning, she calls and we see that she's calling from a pool of what we assume is her own blood. Um, and she says, I told you to leave. Um, and, and, and Paul says something like, uh, we know Dagmar is here. And she says, Dagmar is not what you need to be worried about. Um, it, that, I'm sorry. That scene was so cornball. Oh, it was. It was so, it was so weird. cornball. And totally I mean, unexplained. You know, like, why is she dead now? Or, you know, I presume that her husband killed her for being traitorous or whatever, but, you know, it's just, it's never explained. Um, and, and she obviously yeah. was weird and off put from the beginning, so why does he kill her now? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And the way it's staged, too. Uh, it's just like really this is this is so goofy she's <laughs> laying on the floor but she managed to reach a phone and she's just kind of sprawled out i mean just <laughs> well it's seeing her and, last uh, words to this guy thankfully she was able to call him at just the right moment right exactly uh, you know i don't know you know things were happening so quickly i almost just kind of appreciated the jarring imagery like it came out mm. of nowhere you had no idea what was going on um, but, she, you know, when she says it's not Dagmar that you have to worry about, we already know that the townspeople have vowed to, to kill these people if the spirits in the house aren't going to. Um, but then Dagmar, through Jacob, continues talking, and he says, um, we were good people. Uh, this town murdered my family. They sacrificed them to the gods or something. Again, this is one of those places where I rewound it several times to try to hear exactly what he was saying, and I never could get it fully. He says something like, they opened something awful, and it needs a family or, or something like that. Well, there are um, allusions earlier about something about what the ho- what's under the house. Something's under the house. Right, uh, and like in the basement, there's a big hole in a wall, and you know they wonder if there's something behind there, but they can't really see. It's never really explained. Um, so yeah, I mean, obviously there's something going on with the with the house or the location. It was built on an ancient Indian burial ground. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, could it we could never just as easily have been? Yeah. Well, I feel like at this point um, on, uh, you know, it does get pretty real, and they're running around inside the house. Um, not really trying to go outside the house because the well, townspeople it, are closing in on them. It, well, and it just um, happens so quickly. You know, Jacob, after he delivers the message that he's got to deliver, I suppose, he just grabs a fireplace poker and stabs himself in the eye with it, and he's dead. Yeah. So then they go they, – they do initially try to run outside, and, and May is leading them. And I liked this shot. She opens the door, and we're just seeing her from behind, and we don't see anything in front of her, and her head just gets blown off. Um, yeah. and, and I didn't see that coming. You know, I didn't no. expect all of these characters to be – 
or I say all, I mean, it's only a, a couple, but, you know, for them not only to die, I didn't necessarily expect them to die, but then in such rapid succession, um, it was it was jarring, and for me, it was kind of jarring in a, a good way because it, it was unexpected. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I think uh, they run upstairs, the, the couple. Um, mm-hmm. Paul and Paul Annie, and yeah. Annie run upstairs. And uh, they're looking out, tr- trying to figure out what they're going to do. At the meantime, it's obvious that all the townspeople are kind of coming to the house, I guess. Yeah, it's to like the whole mob the of town people. Well, this was something that I thought was interesting because I, I've seen – there are two things going on at once. And I've seen them both but never really both at the same time. You've got – the angry townspeople mob coming in, and they're obviously a major threat. But then you've also got the burned apparitions in the house. Um, and, and you kind of think that both of these groups are a danger to Paul and Annie. But as it plays out, you see that the burned apparitions in the house are really targeting the townspeople. Yeah. And, uh, and, and cool. they, they take out the townspeople, you know one by one really pretty quickly and there's some you know i think a lot of the effects were were relatively practical um but they i found them to be pretty pretty darn effective they're effective i I just couldn't quite figure out why the townspeople still felt like they needed to be there why they needed to get upstairs in the midst of them getting picked off you know i mean it, it was just it was just weird like Okay, you're in this house. You think you're you're coming here to piece the ghosts, but you're instead getting killed. Wouldn't you figure out? Okay, well, apparently this isn't what we're supposed to be doing, and turn and hightail and leave. But it, they were just like more resolved to get up those steps, you know, right. in the wake of two the two people before them who got you know either pulled down into the steps or like melted into them or got attacked uh-huh. on them or whatever. Like one woman finally makes it upstairs. Wasn't it the um? The bartender, Maggie. The bartender. And this scene was so oddly staged. It was. You know, she kind of walks in, and it's supposed to be, I guess, quiet, but... um, I couldn't tell what it was supposed to be. Like it, it, it seemed to me like it was supposed to be a setup, like Annie and Paul were setting her up. Um, because Annie had like a fistful of kitchen knives, you know, just, just steak knives. Right, and she's um, facing the window right. away from the stairs. But then as... As as the bartender comes in, Paul all of a sudden yells out, like, oh, she's here, look out. And that's when Annie spins around. It, it was just so weird. Yeah, it was. That that part, because it was unclear to me if they were, you know, just waiting for somebody and they were, you know, they had this plan. That's what I thought. Um, but then Paul acted like he was surprised and, you know, that he had to warn Annie and then she turned around. In the end, it doesn't really matter. You know, she stabs the, the lady in the neck with these knives and she dies. Who, who uh, falls against this, like, white tarp that happens to be there <laughs> so we can get the full effect of the blood spray? Right. <laughs> <clears throat> the other thing that I thought was weird is that they they've said over and over and over again, you know, that the house requires a sacrifice. Well, how big of a sacrifice does the house need? You know, like yeah. <laughs> a bunch of people have already died in here. You know, does it have to be the specific people that live there? All of that was very, you know, hazy. I, I, I wasn't really sure what was going on. Um, but it ends up um, in kind of a, a confrontation between Dave, the creepy neighbor guy. First of all, he's downstairs, and he just straight up confronts the ghosts, uh, who we presume are the Dagmar family, and, and you know one of them is clearly the dad. Um, and Dave says, you know what you have to do. Now get it done. He's, and he says something like, you loved this house so much that you were willing to die for it, and we have been willing to protect you and let you stay here, but you've got to do your part of the deal uh, or whatever. <laughs> Which is like totally flips it around. Right. And that that's, again, another thing that I liked. And um, I was talking about this last night uh, with my partner, who didn't watch the movie with me, uh, by the way, but I was kind of explaining the twist. Um, and he said, oh, it sounds like Stir of Echoes. Um, and I thought, yeah, it is a lot like Stir of Echoes, where you think that the apparition is the bad guy, but it turns out, spoiler alert, uh, if you haven't seen Stir of Echoes, it turns out that it's really not. You know, the apparition was a victim as well. At least that's the way that I read it. 
almost like the Dagmar family had been the first sacrifice, mm-hmm. and then their spirits had stayed around in the house, and then I guess they had helped to continue the sacrifices over the decades. Yeah, that's the part that gets weird. Well, if then if why is the Dagmar family involved in continuing? And, and I mean, the house was built for them. They were the first people in there. Uh, well, that was the story that Dave told, but I don't know that we can necessarily believe everything that he said. You but, know, maybe the house was built and then they, or maybe they built it for this family, but so that the family could be the sacrifice or, or whatever. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, but then there are, you know, during the ending credits, you know, jumping ahead, there are all these newspaper articles. Right. And if you kind of read through them, they seem to almost confirm Dave's side of the story. I, I don't know. Well, when, I guess, you know, it, it, things happen pretty quickly. You know, Dave is saying um, he, he, he talks to the Dagmars and then the couple, Annie and Paul, come down and he talks to them. Um, and he says something like, um, well, Paul says, what do you want? And he says, it's not what I want. It's what the house wants. Um, you will stay here and satisfy the darkness. And he says, anyway, why would you want to leave and leave your little boy all alone? Um, so I guess he is saying, you know, your son is here and, and you should just go along with this so that you can be with him forever. Um, but then the Dagmars kill Dave and it kind of seems like that's the end of it. And then, like I said before, Paul and Annie had kind of been hearing this whispering and they thought that it was Bobby. And there's whispering again. I rewound it. I cranked the TV up. Um, the whispering says, don't be afraid, mom. Mm -hmm. And, um... Uh, so she goes walking towards the cellar and I think Paul, the dad says, we're still here, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. get the title in there. Um, and he walks down to the cellar and we don't see anything. We just see his face. He looks down the stairs and he says, hi, Bobby. And that's, that's it. You know, that's, that's the end of the movie proper before we get to this interesting, um, uh, credit sequence, um, and I I still don't know what to make of it. You know, no, the I whole time, either. the whole time I thought, you know, that the apparitions in the house were maybe just leading them to believe that Bobby was there, so that um, so that they would stay or they would be an easier target or whatever. But then it seems to indicate at the end that maybe he was there all along. Maybe he was, um, you know, helping them, and and maybe even that the fact that he was there is maybe the reason that the Dagmars didn't kill this family. Uh, I, I don't know. Tons of questions um, left. Um, but the credits, uh, it, like you said, it's a bunch of newspaper articles, and it chronicles back you know, all the way to the 1800s. And what I took from it, it has the history, you know, every 30 years – something terrible happened in this town. You know, one year all their crops died. One year all their livestock died. One year there was a fire or something like that. Um, And tell me if if this is what you took from it too, was that there was something bad happening in that town and the townspeople figured out that if they made a sacrifice every 30 years, they could prevent these bad things from happening. Is that kind of what you got from it yeah i mean it wasn't clear on what the sacrifice was but after having watched the movie we assume oh somebody moved into the house or they pushed somebody into the house or something like that and then the house took care of these people and then boom yeah the the uh the rivers ran clear again and you know the crops uh were the the fields were fertile again um yeah that's kind of what i took out of it. it it still leaves open that question of well you know, he said, it's not what I want, it's what the house wants. Well, if the house is perfectly capable of getting what it wants, aside from maybe ensuring that there's somebody in the house every 30 years, why do the townspeople need to keep tabs on whether they're dead or not and whether they're dead in two weeks or not? You know what right. I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. And again, you know, you're the big Fulci fan. I've only seen the one movie that you showed me. But from that one movie, I remember that there just are unanswered questions, you know, like that's, you just have to kind of deal with it. You know, not everything is laid out for you. Things happen that are not easily explained. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I I guess, okay. (laughs) You know, it only gets frustrating when you feel like the filmmaker at some point feels like they're explaining it to you, you know? Yeah. Like because of exposition, man, (laughs) 
<laughs> right, right. You know, who comes along at all the right times to really just lay it out and in a really clunky, unnatural way. I feel like you're supposed to end this movie, and, and, it, and if that's not enough, you get these newspaper articles at the end. I feel like you're supposed to end this movie with a fairly clear idea of what's going on. Right. But it's so I don't feel like it's deliberately written to be obtuse, you know? Mm hmm. But it is so obtuse. Yeah, you know, I <laughs> having sat here and talked with you for almost an hour about it now, I get the strong feeling that you weren't really a big fan of this movie. And I, I got to say, I, I'm a little bit surprised. I kind of thought you would have liked it more than you did. And I didn't not like it. it I, I, I thought it was fine. You know, there, there were cliched things about it, but it kept me interested. Um, it kept me questioning. Not all of the questions were answered, but I didn't walk away from it feeling totally... Un- dissatisfied i didn't walk away from it you know with my hands in the air saying what did i just watch what just happened yeah there were lots of uh, maybe plot holes some inconsistencies but overall i found it to be a, a pretty entertaining film for you know an hour and 25 minutes no don't get me wrong i mean i felt it was entertaining i didn't hate the film i didn't think it was a piece of crap and i wasted my time um but i guess if the movie's not going to make sense I want it to make up for it in some way. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And and that way has got to be, it's got to have some serious style, you know? Yeah. Or it's got to have some great acting. Or it has to have some characters that I really cared about. Um, and I can't say that I found any of those three things in abundance in this movie. Fair um, enough. Yeah, I just felt that like... It had its moments, don't get me wrong. It had its real moments. The seance scene was fantastic. Mm-hmm. The boldness of these apparitions meaning business and get even getting out of the house to murder right. somebody in their car and doing it full on um, was, was cool. Um, but at the end of the day, I guess it, it, in a way it kind of felt amateur hour compared to what I'm used to with the other movies that don't make sense that at least have quite a bit of style behind them, which, you know, again, like the full chief films that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe that just, co- you know, this is just one man's opinion, right? right? Um, you may not be touched by those old Italian giallo flicks like I obviously am. Um, you'd think that because I'm so touched by them, this kind of homage would, you know, I'd be falling all over myself for but I'm really not for the same reason I wasn't falling all over myself uh, for Night of the Creeps, in that it's homage, just cut and pasted homage um, in a modern sort of updated setting, or at least with modern cinematic techniques and a modern acting style and things like that, just doesn't always work uh, I, yeah. for me. And to me, I feel like it worked almost as well as some of the other movies that are going for the same type of thing. You know, I feel like, um, is it is it Ty West who did uh, House yeah, of the Devil? Yeah, House of the De- uh, Devil, which and, I also didn't care for. Oh, you, well, see, and I kind of did. Um, so maybe mm-hmm. it's just a different sensibility, you know, and, and he also did um, The Innkeepers, right? Which I love. And you liked that one. And see, now mm. I think, um, you know, even this movie is in tone and style a little bit reminiscent of that. Um, So I guess, you know, it's just a matter of taste. You know, this one wasn't your cup of tea. I didn't love it. It wasn't one of my favorite movies ever, but... uh, uh, And and I'm not really sure... I, if I see, and maybe I would need to read, you know, the reviews and the criticisms or whatever. Mm. Um, you know, it's got such positive response. Maybe they're seeing something that I missed. I, I don't know if I understand why it's gotten so much um, praise, um, but I, I, I liked it. I thought it was a solid effort. Yeah, fair enough. Well, thank you so much for listening to another episode. If you enjoyed us, please share this episode with a friend. They can find us on iTunes. They can find us on Stitcher. If you enjoy this podcast, please check out our Facebook page. Like us on there. Share that with a friend as well. And leave us some comments. Let us know what you enjoyed. Let's start a conversation online. Continue that uh, with each other. And let us know a a film or two that you'd like us to review in the future. Until then, I'm Todd. I'm Craig. With two guys and a chainsaw. (laughs) 